gotten our focus today and all the way through is how we can touch people in our lives, community, reaching out to folks, quite frankly, becoming people of shalom, that is peace. There's more to it. Later on, we'll be giving a fuller definition. But becoming those people that as in our text that we read this morning as Phil read on the front of your, your bulletins, Jesus sends out his 70. They're going through all these towns before he gets there. They get there first, and the one phrase that I want you to pick up from our reading is this, that when they come to the town, they say, peace to this house. And if someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. They go into the town and they are to find the person of peace, people of peace. In the culture in that particular time, if you were a person of peace and you greeted someone or welcomed somebody in your home, as long as you were under that roof, you were part of their family. They had the obligation in that culture to protect you from any harm. So it's interesting that Jesus says, okay, when you go into a town, find the person of peace. And my question as I ponder that is that am I a person of peace? Am I one who shares and expresses shalom in another person's life? Am I that person that might if somebody came to my door, would I be welcoming? We have people like that in our lives, exactly people of peace. You probably can think of your life. Individuals that are open to you, and they're not, they have no idea anything about whether you're a Christian or not. doesn't matter. They're open to you in discussion, and you find them as a person of peace because it opens doors to other people through them. There's connection. As a person of peace in your life, but am I, are you a person of peace, one who is giving shalom? And Jesus said, when you enter the house, first say, peace to this house. And if someone promotes peace there, your peace will rest on them. If not, let it return to you. Stay there eating and drinking wherever you get you, they give you, for the worker deserves wage. So the question that co comes to my mind, are we, as followers of Jesus, the one who gives shalom, peace? people in the sphere of influence that we have? Are we that person? Jesus said this, blessed are the peacemakers for they are the children of God. The peacemakers. Those that make peace. Those of people who share and give shalom. Well, let's define it. What's shalom? That's a Hebrew word. But here it is with society as well as physical in our culture, society, or physically. It means completeness, wholeness, health, peace, welfare, safety, soundness, tranquility, prosperity, perfectness, fullness, rest, harmony, the absence of agitation. Or discord. When we say the word shalom, it entails all these things, whether wholeness or, or health or peace or the welfare of another, that you're offering shalom, peace. 
And that's just not physically wholeness, physical wholeness, but also in culture and society in which we live. It's offering that to others in our sphere of influence. I want to turn to Jeremiah 29. I ask that you would join me there. Jeremiah chapter 29. And Jeremiah is, writes a letter to those that are in captivity. Now, in this particular letter, he, we're told that Jeremiah tells the people in captivity they're going to be there for some time. They're going to be in captivity for 70 years. So what do we do? Jeremiah tells them by the word of the Lord what they're to do while they're in captivity in Babylon. Now Babylon was a place where uh, over and over again, uh, Babylon as a, a major city, from there is the capital. And they conquered many people, and in the conquering, they brought people to that city from all over the place, from the people that they've conquered along the way. It's, it was a, it's, it's more people in that particular city than there would be in maybe Washington, D.C. today. But if you think of Washington, D.C., you think of all the different cultures that are coming together. Well, that's what happens in Bob, Babylon. And so these folks that are taken from Judah into captivity to Babylon are to do something in those 70 years. Let's read together. Beginning with verse 4. This is the letter Jeremiah sends to those. This is what the Lord Almighty says, the God of Israel. Say to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses, settle down, plant gardens, and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give daughters in, <coughs> in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also seek the peace, that's the shalom, and prosperity of the city which I've carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, do not let the prophet or diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams uh, you, uh, you encourage them uh, they ha to have. They prophesy lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed from Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and, I, and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and place you where I have, uh, from where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. <coughs> We sometimes use that verse, you know, we may have a, that wall plaque on the wall, the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, we might have it in your home. 
But you notice the context here? This is 70 years of captivity. He's telling them, God is telling them, that they're going to have 70 years of captivity. And don't listen to those prophets that are, are saying it's only going to be a short time. We're going to be back. But what do they do in the meantime there in Babylon? They're to grow. They're to plant crops. They're to put have an investment in the city. Because because of their presence there, peace would be there in the city. And as long as the city prospers, they too will prosper in captivity. Why? Because God has a plan to prosper them. And a future and a hope beyond captivity. He says, I'm going to bring you back. So right now, invest in where you are. Touch people's lives. Bring peace to the place in which God, and quite frankly, another way of translating that exile thing, is where I sent you. God sent them. Think about it. Wait a minute, I thought it was judgment, yes. But God calls them to get there. He sent them to Babylon. Why? To be the witness. For peace. I wonder. Quite frankly, when we talk about our city, our town, Shiloh, Shiloh would not exist if it wasn't for the church. If we were not here in Shiloh, as a church, Shiloh wouldn't exist it. Think about it. We would not have this building. We would not have anything as far as ministry is concerned at all. There wouldn't be a Shiloh. Think about it. It kind of points up some, <clears throat> well, points up something very important, I think, when we think about being a per people of being shalom for other people. I pondered this question in my mind, and I don't know how you respond to it. If we did not exist, for some reason we were shut down here, we could not come here for worship. Would anybody notice that we weren't there? That's a tough one. If we did not come here, I mean, if we did not exist or somehow... I don't know, it's a, like a wonderful life. It's a wonderful life. You know the movie, right? And George Bailey ends up, you know, he says, man, I, I, it's not worth it anymore. You know, and I, and I'm worth more dead than alive. And he's blessed, what? He, he gets an opportunity to see what it was like if he wasn't there. A.W. Tozer and uh, his meditations on worship and I think I've used this illustration before, but he says, suppose, just suppose that God chooses, which he says probably wouldn't completely happen ever, but suppose God chooses to take the Holy Spirit out of the church. How much of the programs, how much of the things that we do as far as ministry we'd continue to do? We wouldn't even notice the Holy Spirit was gone. How much? How much of the things that we do in sharing peace, if we try to, try to express peace to people, how much of that we do in our own strength and our own ability? And if the Holy Spirit isn't in it, well, you know, I'm still going to do it anyway. And it all becomes about us. 
and the people that we try to deal with or, or speak to, deal with, yes, become projects to us and not people. Let's look at this. We, there are three options to be the church in our town, Silo. Here's, here, here's the first one. And, and maybe we're not there. Maybe this is where we, we may be there. We can be a church apart from the community. What do I mean? Well, we can, we can see the community. We can see how families are broken down. We can see alcohol and drugs, and they are here in Shiloh. They're here. We can see uh, the, uh, the loss of education in our city, our town, our borough. Okay? We can see all that stuff, and the one thing that we can do is point the finger and say, how bad is it? Those people out there are so bad and so wor worse that, oh, no, no, we got to hold where we're at because we're holy. We're a little bit like the Pharisee in the parable. Luke 18, 11 and 12 says this, there's this Pharisee stood by himself and prayed. God, I thank you that I'm not like the other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. He was very proud of that, that he's not like them. It's a <clears throat> I often wonder in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Think about that. In that parable, we've got a guy got beat up. He's alongside the road. He's, he's almost left for dead, and you got a priest and a Levite going by on the other side of the road. And the Samaritan, you know the story, some of you? The Samaritan who's unlike, uncared, who, looked, <clears throat> who was looked down upon, prejudiced against Samaritans, Jesus uses him in the story to go help the guy. And beyond helping the guy, not just healing his wounds, but taking it. But what about the Levite and the, and the priest? You think that they came to the end of the day, and they're, maybe they, they're praying in their prayer. And they're saying, well, God, thank you for keeping me clean today. I didn't go over there and help that guy. Thank you, I, I, I was able to worship at the temple today. Because I was kept pure and not defiled. It's what it's about, is it? It's about the Samaritan doing this, touching, <coughs> giving and sharing and producing peace in that life of that man who's been killed or half dead. He was the person of peace in that story. So we can point the finger at our community and go, oh, that's, that's really bad. I don't want to do that. I'm not like that. So therefore, we don't engage with, the, with them at all. The second way is this. We can be a church in community. In the community. We can be just like the community where we look and become so much like the community that there isn't anything that makes us distinctive with the community. We can live more like the community than we look like Jesus. In other words, there's no difference. The one way is that we won't do anything well because we don't want to become like, but we can become like and we be in the community and become just like the community in such a way there's no gospel in that. There's no sharing of the gospel. There's no, nothing about sin. There's nothing about God's salvation that he offers. There's nothing about being people of peace. We come just like it. It doesn't matter. There, there's a whole series. A number of years ago, 
There was a number of churches that did this one thing. They tried to redesign their worship services. And they called them seeker-sensitive service. And what did that mean? What it meant in their context was that they tried to design a service that would meet the need of whoever might show up, the common Joe or Sally, you know, they, you know there's certain traits that the common Joe and the common Sally in, in, in life, apart from Jesus, and how they lived and their attitudes, so they decided to try to design a worship service in order to that whoever, for, and the purpose of whoever's here in attendance would be able to get something out of the service. So there's a problem with that. And that is those that just began to design their worship services, that way they found out there was no discipleship going on. Oh, they had attendance. Well, great, great attendance. It was about uh, what? <laughs> their life was about an inch deep and spread out. They realized that they needed to do discipling. They need to become people of peace. So that it's not just an inch deep, but that's deep, deep, deep in their relationship with the Lord and able to pass it on and continue to pass it on. So we can become just like the community. Or here it is. We, thirdly, we can be, be a church that is followers of Jesus for the community. For the community. The word church you, know, you understand, and hopefully you have that in your vocabulary. When we talk about church, we're talking about people. You, we are the church. We're not talking about a building. We're not talking about uh, wherever you go. You're a follower of Jesus wherever you go, whether it's the grocery store or down there having a cup of coffee down here, down here at the market. Wherever you are, you're the church. You represent Jesus. You are a follower of Jesus, and you can, there's absolutely, clearly, no matter where you are, it, that doesn't change. And yet we have in our vocabulary about going to church. We go to church. That's our attitude. We go there. It's something that we do here. But the reality is, it's not just here that we are the church. We're a church everywhere. The definition of church, maybe you, some of you know this, ecclesia, it's two parts, ek meaning from or, or out from or to, and kaleo means to call. <clears throat> Properly, it's people called out from the world to God. And the outcome is being the church outcome. We're called out by God to touch our world with Jesus, to be people of shalom, to bring completeness, wholeness, health, peace, welfare, safety, soundness, tranquility, uh, faithfulness, rest, harmony, absence of agitation. That's our role as the church, to be people called out to be, to be. What does it look like as a follower of Jesus to offer for the community this shalom? What does that look like? From a historical view, there's a couple of areas. One, particularly, I, I want to point out from a history of the church. In the 13, from 1348 to 1350, there was something that hit all throughout Europe, and that was the Black Plague, the Black Death that killed one-third of the entire population between Iceland and India. Well, what was the 
church doing or what were Christians doing during that plague? Philip Schaefer wrote <clears throat> concerning what Christians did. They were untiring day and night healing those who are physically in despair. Physicians, excuse me, physicians despaired. They raised the dead. For Christians, Carolyn Marshall says, Christians perform the most distressing nursing chores among the incurable ill of cancer and leprosy. When patients were in pain and often abusive, they believed that they, these experience of help, that they shared in the sufferings of Christ Jesus. Christians were there when people were going and dying on their deathbed, going through things physically. Christians were there. They risked themselves and they offered shalom. Today in our modern time, you talk about India. Let's, let's talk about India for a moment. Who do you think are the ones that took care are taking care of people today that are on the lowest caste, who are ill and sick and maybe dying. Who do you think are the ones who are doing that and touching their lives? Buddhists? Muslims? No, it's the Christian. It's the Christian that is there, offering that peace, touching their lives, of the most the bottom of Indian society. Literally Christians moving in to plant a church in the midst of mud and slop and all kinds of stuff around them and that lowest caste that are put out. And Christians moving in and touching their lives, and building, in the midst of all this, a church growth. Because the offering of shalom. Let's get personal for a moment. In our, our individual lives. How, as you, as a follower of of Jesus that offers shalom, you teachers, how do you offer shalom to a child? How are you doing that as a follower of Jesus in the classroom? Can you imagine? Here's this kid in your classroom. You know he's struggling. You don't know the life, his life, his family life. Maybe you might have an inkling, but he's struggling. Or she's struggling in her with something. Maybe it's a mat in math. And what do you do? You recognize the problem, the situation, you take time, and you try to get them to understand about the math problem or whatever the situation. And you know that shalom happens in their life. How do you know? The kid goes, I got it now. I understand it now. Right? They got it. You're bringing wholeness. You're bringing something to their life that they never had before. Because the child begins, to, ah, yes, I didn't get it before, but thank you. You spent time with me. I understand. That's offering shalom, offering wholeness and completeness and health and all these things that only the one who follows Jesus can do. What about those of your coworkers? You know, some of you work in shops, some of you work in other, other 
industries or, or on the line. How does one, what does that look like? You're a follower of Jesus and you're offering shalom to your co-worker. What does that look like? Well, quite, quite frankly, it's, um, it's being aware that the person in the next cubicle or the next line or whatever is not just a coworker. He's they got a story, right? There's more to them than just the fact that you're working with them. There's a story, and you find out that maybe there's in there that per, uh, coworker's family or they're they're struggling. They're, there's an illness. Somebody's sick. They're in the hospital. How do you offer God's peace as a follower of Jesus? You take the time outside of work to go visit that person in the hospital. You can't cure it. You can't cure the illness. Only God can do that. But the point is, is that to you now, that person is more than just somebody you work with. Because you intentionally took time to show interest, to notice. My dad, and I'll just put this out here. I don't know whether it'll be in your case or not. My dad worked in a <clears throat> worked in a in, in a carpentry. Uh, cabinet, custom cabinets, and so forth. When I was growing up, he was a he started an apprentice right out of of high school, in carpent uh, as a car apprentice carpenter. He was with the business, was with family business. But as he come to know Jesus and the relationship with him, he wanted to reach out to others in that company those that he worked with. And so he went to the boss and said, uh, I'd like to get together before work. Can we have a room before work? And, and just for some of us just to come get together and relate to each other before work, maybe have prayer together. And the boss gave permission. So he invited some of the guys that he worked with just to, just to come, and be part of that time before work started, to be there in that room and to be joined together with him. He got to know his more than just the guys that he worked with in that instance. So dad and, and mom, too, when one of the guys in this little group, co-workers, whether there was illness or struggling with something, mom and dad would take a Sabbath afternoon and go visit that co-worker, whether there's an illness, a life, or something that's struggling in the hospital. They would make, intentionally choose. To be a blessing. To be the blessing. To be shalom for those that they're working with. There's just a couple of suggestions. But here's the challenge. Are you ready for it? Here's the challenge, and the challenge is this. Who in my sphere of influence will I offer shalom this next week to? Whether in, within, with somebody here, and somebody without. Somebody you work with, somebody you you're acquainted with, maybe somebody at the grocery store, whatever. Somebody within our 
group and somebody without. Now, here's the thing. The challenge is this. You've got to be intentional. You've got to choose to do it. That's the challenge. The challenge, will I be that person of peace? Will I share shalom, wholeness, completeness with somebody? And that's why I said within, because that probably would be a little easier to do with each other. You know somebody that you've been, you, you hang out here with, right? That's maybe a little easier to have intentionality to say, well, I'm going to bless them this week. That's in your court, okay? But the other one may be a little harder because intentionality means, uh-oh, i got to risk to be that person for somebody else in my life or I'm acquainted with or I touch on it every day. Now, here's the thing. Don't take so long thinking about who. All right? Because we get to that trap, we go, oh my God, okay, God, God, lead me to the person. Come on, lead me to the person. And you start thinking about, okay, now, now I don't know, not that one. Uh, that one, that one. What I'm saying is, take the person in front of you, intentionally bless them. Intentionally bless them. Be the person of shalom. That could include uh, eating together, having a cup of coffee together, whatever. Intentionally do that. I'll tell you, if you do that this next week, Jesus is going to, we're going to see miracles of God doing stuff. And you will see it through you, God doing things and touching people. But it, again, it's got to be intentional. You've got to choose to do it. Yes, I'm committed. I'm going to do it. We can do all that. You can choose to do this. But here's the thing. If you don't have peace and shalom yourself, you ain't, you got nothing to give. If your heart is not at peace and you don't find wholeness and you yourself don't have not just physical health but soul health, you got nothing to give. You can't offer shalom. I can't offer shalom unless, and you know, the answer to this is the gospel. The gospel. It's through Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross that gives us wholeness, completeness, soul health. No longer rebellion against God. No longer choosing to sin on my own and saying, no, okay, that's the pattern of my life. I'm No. It's coming to Jesus and having a heart change, transformed by the gospel, so that now I have the peace that passes all understanding. I don't get it. Things are happening in my life, but I, I still have that relationship with him. He's in my life because of the cross. If you don't have that peace I'm talking about, that shalom in your own heart, please settle it. Settle it. Nobody else can do it for you. Only you and God can settle it. Because he offers peace, he offers wholeness, he offers all the things that shalom is. No more fighting against God. Surrender to him.
And in that moment of surrender of your heart, you find peace with God. And you have something to give to the world and the people that you are influencing, people that you work with, people. Do you settle it? Let's pray.